Greetings, beloved, and thank you for joining me here at May United Methodist Church as we gather for worship for September 1st, 2024. Let us call ourselves into this time and place of worship. We come this day with joy to worship God. We do not come to justify ourselves. For you, O oh God, accept us as we are. Out of your great love, we come with joy to worship you. We come with grateful hearts to worship you. Let us pray together. O oh Lord our God, we call to you in our desire to know you and to make your ways our own. Teach us, claim us, transform us, that we may serve you with our whole selves and do the will of our God in heaven. O oh Lord, be with us now in our worship. Amen. The gospel lesson for today comes out of the Gospel of Mark, selections from the seventh chapter. <clears throat> and so just to give you a sense of, of where this moment takes place, Mark places this story, which is a, a confrontation between the Pharisees and some of the, the legal experts of Jerusalem um, and Jesus. And, and so uh, the Pharisees are critiquing Jesus' lack of commitment to the rules of Jewish living, um, particularly to some that have been passed down by the elders, which in my way is saying this is a priority of the church and not necessarily a priority of God, right? And that's where the clash comes together. But I think it's helpful to know that this moment takes place in the midst of a series of miracles that Jesus performs that Mark is telling about. So in the previous chapter to this, we see the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus walks on water. He does a miraculous healing. Those three stories lead into this conflict. And then we find in the very next story, Jesus has a very inter inter interesting reaction with the Syrophoenician woman. So that would have been a woman who would be a, an outsider. to the Jew And yet she is humbled and faithful to God in a way that are, the Pharisees are not. So those two stories stand in stark contrast. And then following that, Mark goes back into telling more miracles. There's more miraculous healing. There's the feeding of the 4,000 and some of those other stories. So you get this moment of conflict. And the reason I think that's important as you hear the story um, is I think it's clear to me when I read it that the Pharisees feel threatened, right? Jesus is new. And now he's doing these amazing things, and people are starting to listen to what he's saying. And so they're looking for ways to sort of critique and undermine him as a leader. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of this conflict that will eventually unfold, of course, in, in eventually Jesus' crucifixion. But in this moment of time, Jesus will respond to the Pharisees, and then he's talking to the crowd and the disciples, and he's challenging them to think differently, and I would say to think deeper about what it means to be a follower of God. We use the word disciple now, um, but what, what does it mean to be a faithful disciple? Like, what is that, and what's, what should be some of our priorities in, in that journey? And so here are these verses from Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees and some legal experts from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating food with unclean hands. They were eating without first ritually purifying their hands through washing. The Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat without first washing their hands carefully. This is a way of observing the rules handed down by the elders. Upon returning from the marketplace, they don't eat without first immersing themselves. They observe many other rules that have been handed down such as the washing of cups, jugs, pans, and sleeping mats. So the Pharisees and legal experts asked Jesus, why are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders, but instead eat food with ritually unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah really knew what he was talking about when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He wrote, the people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is empty, since they teach instructions that are human words. 
You ignore God's commandment while holding on to rules created by humans and handed down to you. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said, listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing outside of a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. It's from the inside, from the human heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual sins, thefts, murders, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, insults, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evils come from the inside and contaminate a person in God's sight. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you hear the song of reflection, I'm going to invite you, whether you grew up going to church or or not, I imagine you were aware of church existing, even if you and your family didn't attend. What are some of the rules, if you will, that whether you grew up or even now, What are some of the rules that you think, why does this matter? You have have no connection to its significance. What are some of the rules that you would say people created as part of controlling each other instead of being a part of serving the Lord faithfully? Just ponder some of those thoughts while you hear the song of reflection.
Beloved, will you pray with me? Glorious God, we seek to know you. Our hearts are drawn to you. And yes, we have contaminated ourselves with sin. But you continue to make us clean in your forgiveness and mercy in the life and death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so our hearts yearn, yearn for your mercy, yearn for your love. And we have gathered into this moment to ponder your word. And so I offer myself up to you, God. I ask that you protect all that would hear this message, that no harm would ever come from my words, but instead that you would be able to use me, move me out of your way, speak your word, your truth, that disciples need to hear this day, that we might all grow closer to you with purer hearts and in faithful discipleship. In your name we pray. Amen. It's interesting to me when I study scripture that it doesn't, there are pieces of humanity that are very consistent. Uh, and one of them is that we have always struggled as, as, a, as a creation, right? Not just as individual individuals, but humanity throughout history, throughout texts that we have from thousands of years ago, we have struggled with hypocrisy, right? Which it is this sense of, I look right, but I am not actually right. I'm doing the things that make me look good, but I'm not actually trying to change who I am, to allow myself to be transformed to the glory of God, right? Um, and people throughout the history of time, since there has been organized religion, since Long before we had Christian church and there were other groupings, human beings have come up with rules. This is what it looks like when you are faithful. And some of those insights have, have come straight from a holy scripture. Some of them have been incredibly helpful. And some of them have become tainted over time. The original intent was likely very pure, and it likely did serve a purpose and a community in that time frame. But over the course of time, humans tend to use those rules to create insiders and outsiders, those who are faithful and those who are not, the implication being there are some people who are better than other people. And I would tell you that throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, we consistently hear that is not the perspective of God that God does not see some people as better than others, no matter their behavior, because when God looks at us, God sees sin present in all of us. Jesus references a passage out of Isaiah. We hear it in other prophets, this warning. It isn't about what you say. It's about who you are, right? In the book of Psalms, in Psalm 51, we're reminded, we read this one at the start of nearly every season of Lent, I do not want your burnt offerings, God says. The sacrifice I desire is a pure heart, right? It isn't about the rituals that you're doing. They don't make you clean. I make you clean. And your dedication to being clean from your heart is what actually matters. And in the Gospels, in each of the Gospels, Jesus rails is the word I would use of of all the times that Jesus is offering correction and insight, some of the strongest, most aggressive language is when Jesus is talking about the issue of hypocrisy. We see it in, in a variety of ways, but, you know, it's not about praying in public and like, ooh, look how amazing they are. It's, do you mean those prayers sincerely from your heart? It's not about the check you write and that because it's bigger, therefore you are more faithful than someone that has less to give. Like, what nonsense, Right. And then we hear it in Paul's letters, right? You're so worried about these rules. Do you have to be circumcised or not? Do you need to eat kosher foods or not? You're worrying about the wrong things, Paul says. And, and you're coming at them from the wrong perspective. So we hear it throughout the course of time. Humans develop rituals for an important reason. Because in many ways, our relationship with God is intangible, right? 
you can't hug God. We talk about having conversations with God, and while I am someone who, who would testify that I have heard the voice of God in my life, it's not a consistent conversation like I can have with another human being. There's an awful lot of trust and guesswork that goes into it. And so we use rituals to use our senses, touch, taste, um, smell, sight, sound, right? These, these ways of experiencing God that makes God more tangible for us, right? And so in, in, our, in our modern world, right, um, we use baptism for this, right? The feel of the water is representative. The water is not magic water, and the pastor performing it is not performing some sort of magical act. The work that is being done in that person's life, be they infant, child, or adult, the work that's being done is, is done through the Holy Spirit. It's done through the pouring out of the grace of God that God does upon everybody. We utilize the ritual so that we can more strongly connect, so that we can regularly acknowledge with one another the grace of God is present long before we have any sort of intellectual comprehension of God. God is already changing us, right, which should remind us that it's not about intellectual comprehension. It's about this connection between our spirit and the Holy Spirit, right? We use the sacrament of communion. It, to me, it is incredibly sacred. But again, the bread that we use and the juice or the wine, depending on a person's tradition, are not magic, right? The words that I say, the blessing that I offer, it's not like, and poof, now I have transformed through my magical abilities, the power invested in me, right? No, I offer a blessing and we experience it because it's a community experience where we can taste and actually feel between our teeth and let absorb into our body. It's a representation that Christ is constantly entering into us, weaving himself deeper as our Savior into the essence of who we are so that we might be made free of sin and death. That's why we do the rituals, you know, and, and there are people that get very rigid over those rituals, those symbols. Now, I'm not making this suggestion, but I want you to know that at different youth events, I have experienced commun communion with Doritos and Diet Coke, and it was every bit as sacred for me as the loaf and the cup doesn't have to be bread and grape juice. We, we use those because that's what Christ used at the final table. But again, it isn't about what you break. It isn't about what you drink. It is that whatever you're holding in your hand connects you more deeply. Whatever it is you put into your mouth connects you more deeply to the Christ that broke himself and shed his blood so that we might be forgiven so that we would not need to be broken. Our blood would not need to be shed for us to find forgiveness, that, that Christ has done that for us. This is the point of some of our rituals, right? Um, and when we have that understanding, when we approach them from that perspective, they can have deep and rich meaning. The challenge is when we use those rituals to exclude people, when we use those as a demarcation to somebody is in, and somebody is out. <clears throat> it has long been the conviction of certain Christian traditions that if you are not baptized, you are not saved. And I struggle with that because baptism is a human ritual and salvation is an act of God. Now, does baptism have meaning and purpose? Absolutely. It's important. For us to say, I claim Jesus as my Savior, or that I'm doing that on behalf of a child until they can make this decision for themselves. It's important that the community says, this child is already sacred and has value and matters, and we will treat them as such and help them to know the love of Christ in their lives. Help them to learn the things they need to learn so that they might be faithful disciples. And we will be present as a community because we recognize that parents can't do it all by themselves. And I would argue should not. They need the community to surround them. That's what makes baptism sacred. And I have known Christians that would look into the eyes of parents 
whose child died moments or within hours of birth and could not be baptized and tell them, I'm not sure your child knows salvation. How can we have such hubris in our actions? How can we minimize so deeply the power of God, that God somehow needs me as a pastor to put water over a child's head and to speak words in order to save and offer salvation to that child? And do we believe that a loving God that came and gave himself on the cross would deny a child access to the kingdom because no words were said and no water was poured? To me, this seems foolish. But to others, they are deep conviction. But to me, it is a challenge that we face. And it goes beyond the sacred rituals. And this is when it becomes particularly hypocritical and particularly challenging. When we worry about details that, to me, shouldn't be the primary detail. So let me offer a couple of examples. I'm sure you will relate to one of these, especially if you are my age and older. If you're my age and younger, you might have experienced some of this, maybe not quite as much. I remember being taught, this is how you pray. But what I was taught when I was being told that was not how you pray should be sincere. You should always be honest with God. You should be open with God. You should feel free to share your burdens with God. This is how you pray. These are the important pieces, that, that prayer connects you to God and that the practice of it is a chance for you to be fully vulnerable to the one God that we can trust and be vulnerable with, that there is no other human being we can trust to that extent. You know, and, and to put our burdens down, to let go of our sins, to open ourselves to the way that God wants to love us. This And so prayer, when anybody talks to me about what makes a prayer good or bad, I always say to people, there's not good prayer and bad prayer. There is sincere prayer and insincere prayer. That's, that should be the spectrum we live upon. And we want to be in the place of sincerity. We should not say words that have no meaning for us. Right? We should not speak things to God if we don't believe them. Right? Even if we say to God, I, I don't know about this, so maybe I'll mouth the words, but... I'm not there yet, God, to be honest with God. But I wasn't taught any of those things in Sunday school. I was taught you need to fold your hands and you need to close your eyes and you need to bow your head. That prayer is about being humble before God, absolutely. And that this is how you pray. It is this bodily posture. And then I was taught the words of the Lord's Prayer, a beautiful prayer that we use every week in worship that I use almost daily um, I use it most often when I cannot put into words. I just use the Lord's Prayer. I think it's beautiful and it's glorious. But I was told that's how you pray. These words, this posture. That isn't in Scripture. Jesus offers those words. But Jesus prays himself using many other words. Why do we worry about such things? And, and I remember being corrected if my eyes weren't closed or if my head wasn't bowed, or my hands weren't clasped correctly. One of two postures, right? And as an adult, I have struggled, even though it fulfills me, to stand and pray like this, which for me, it isn't that I'm not humble, right? I am humble because I, I am extending my arms to God. I'm, and I understand that God doesn't exist in the clouds, but to me, it is powerful when I need to open myself. And so I need my posture to be vulnerable, to be open, to expose my heart and my chest, the vulnerable organs of my physical body, and say, God, I call out to you for your forgiveness, for your mercy, your compassion, your strength. And I'm trying to welcome that into who I am. That may not relate for you at all. Why do we care how somebody's body is postured? Why, do, why would we teach our children this is the right way to pray. This is a way to pray. This is, and when we pray in this posture, it's because we're feeling this. We're feeling humbled. We're recognizing that the power of God is so much that it has burned the faces of people. And so, so we, we, we put our head down. But we can also pray in this posture or in this posture. You can pray sincere. Some of the most sincere prayers I have ever prayed in my life was while I was driving my car. 
Who knew this was the prayer posture? It is not God that worries about praying right. That is a human thing. All God says is just tell me the truth. Whatever it is, whatever it is, I'm a big enough God, give it to me. That's how you pray right is, is sincerely. But how many of us have been corrected, told our prayers weren't good because our language wasn't eloquent or because our posture wasn't correct? Challenging, right? One that I have found to be even more present that is actually even more baffling to me of just how it ever, I mean, I understand how it came into being, but it's this idea that it matters how we dress to come to worship. Now, this has existed for a long time, <clears throat> but it dates back to a time, particularly um, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, when the way you dressed would greatly reveal your socioeconomic status. And it was a common practice, particularly in the 18th and the 19th and into the 20th, early 20th century, um, that those who had status, those who were wealthy of noble families, they were seated closer to the altar. The poor would stand in the back, might not even have a seat. This was taken to such an extreme that you can still see to this day chapels and churches in England that still have the doors. Now, they keep them for historical reasons. They no longer use them. But the pews actually had doors on the end, these little swinging doors, and a family would be given a key. It was their family's pew. But you only got a key if you had enough money. Hmm. Now, where in the gospel do we find that instruction? Yeah, I don't remember that either. And out of that grew this idea that you put on your best. What people don't realize is it was the poor people trying to put on the best clothing they had so that they would seem less poor when they went to church. They would be judged less. They would be seen more as equals in the body of Christ if they put on their very best clothes. By the time most of us were born, that understanding wasn't present. There was less dichotomy, perhaps, in the wealthy and the non-wealthy in our church, to some extent, of, at least of how they dressed. And yet, I can remember as a teenager arguing with my grandmother because I was going to wear pants to church. Never mind that she was also wearing pants, and somehow that was okay because she was older. She couldn't believe I wasn't going to wear a skirt. You're wearing, you're wearing pants. And I wasn't wearing, and at one point I was wearing khakis. So now not only was I not wearing a skirt, I wasn't even wearing what she would consider to be dress pants. How can you go to church dressed this way? And I found, now, she was my grandmother. I loved her. She loved me deeply, and we talked about it in more respectful ways. But what I wanted to say to her is, I am 15, and I am excited to go to church. I want to go and sit and worship. I want to go and be in Sunday school and learn about God, and I want to be a faithful disciple. Why would you care whether I'm wearing a skirt or pants? Why would you care how I'm dressed? Why aren't you rejoicing that you don't have to force me to go? No one ever forced me to go as, as a teenager. In fact, it was my passion around attending church and being a part of it that brought my parents back into regular attendance. That's so rare. I see it in some of our teenagers today. If you think I'm going to critique a single one of our teenagers and how they are dressed, even if it's not how I would want my teenager to dress, I'm excited that they want to be here. People have actually asked me in my six years here at Mayo, what is the dress code? And I reply to them, we do have one, so I'm happy that you asked. We prefer you come closed. That's our dress code. Right, because I have to say honestly, if a person came without clothing to our worship service, I'm not saying we'd ask them to leave, but I do feel that I would approach them feeling very uncomfortable and I'd be concerned. Well, what has brought this person to come without clothing to the worship service? But in the end, I would not argue that they are less worthy to be in worship because they are not wearing clothing. I just acknowledge culturally I'd be a little uncomfortable, but I don't think it's a rule of God. Why would we care? Come to church comfortable. 
And whatever that means, if that means that you wear your Sunday best because for you it is still about honoring who God is and, you're, and that you dress nicely as your expression of that, then wonderful. So long as you are not using that to judge another, to discourage another, especially in a time, I'm just excited people have showed up at all. God does not care whether we wear jeans or shorts, open-toed shoes or clothes. Certainly, I can't imagine that God cares whether we're wearing dresses or pants. Come as you are, just as I am. This is what Christ is telling the people. It's a different rule, this idea of being ritually clean. It has long since fallen away from our religious practices. And so it's, it's so long ago that it's almost hard for us to understand how important it is. Now, we have Jewish brothers and sisters that still fully maintain these rituals. And again, I believe they can be sacred so long as they're coming from a place of this is how I tangibly interact with God. But the Pharisees are worrying about the wrong thing. Jesus is healing people. Jesus is feeding people. Jesus is trying to speak the truth, and they're worried about whether you wash your hands before you sit at the table. And Christ comes across, not only I would say is disappointed, but almost angry. Right? In one of the other Gospels, he refers to them as a brood of vipers because he sees the Pharisees, and I'm sure not every Pharisee was like this, but he sees this group of Pharisees as so interested in tearing someone down rather than building them up. We hear it from Paul as well. Don't, don't tear each other apart. Build one another up. What, what are you doing? Even if you were right and it did matter how you come dressed, why would you approach it from a place of critique and judgment? How could you come dress this way? Instead, why would you not say, hey, we all want to look the same, so we provide robes. Everybody puts on a robe when they come into our church so that everybody looks the same. Then we don't even have to worry about it. Right? I don't, I don't want to do that because it would be hot in the summer, but maybe we'll get short sleeve robes. I don't know. Right? What are you doing, Jesus says. Right? And, and it, even in our time, where washing hands has yet a whole other symbolism of just, it's clean, it's good practice, it's, it's, in some ways it's healthy. But I want you to imagine this. You are camping, and no one other than a little bit of water has washed their hands. And other than a little bit of water, you probably haven't much washed your cookware. And yet you're preparing hot dogs over the fire. And as you sit around and you enjoy those hot dogs, you sing a little bit, you laugh, you enjoy the camaraderie with your fellow campers around the campfire. Your hands are unclean, but your hearts are full of joy and valuing the time that you're having with each other. I want you to picture sitting at a table, which every person is in their nicest clothing. Hands and faces have been scrubbed pristine. No one has come to this table without a spotless outfit, a spotless face and hands. And before you is every type of silverware and goblet, the most beautiful setting of the table. And the food has been prepared and brought out for you, and no one has touched the dishes, have no smudges on them. There is not a speck of dirt to be found. The tablecloth is pristine. And as you sit around this table, the people that are eating with you make you feel shame and guilt. They are polite with one another, but that politeness has an edge, a meanness. That perhaps they ignore the person at the table or they tell someone at the table, you are not to speak. Your words have no value at this table. Now, I have dined under both settings, and I have had joyful experiences and painful experiences under both settings. It's not the camp versus the pristine table. But when I describe those two settings, which of one of them comes across as contaminated to you? Which one of them has the feeling of sacredness, that the presence of God is real? I don't care how we dress or how we position our body. Neither does our Savior. He says, then, really? You're worried about whether they have gone through a ritual of washing their hands? 
That's not what contaminates you. How you prepare your foods or the foods you eat, that's not what makes you dirty. Those were meant to also be symbols. I recognize the purity I am trying to create in my life, in the way that I cook, in the way that I clean, in the way that I treat my home. It is meant to be an expression of the purity you are seeking to find in the salvation of God. It is not meant to be a way that you judge one another, says Christ. And he says, you want to know where contamination comes from? You want to know what the real problem is? It's from within our hearts. It's human hearts. That's where the evil thoughts come from. That's where you have theft and murder and greed and deceit and unrestrained immorality and envy and insults and arrogance and foolishness. This is the contamination you should worry about because it is a plague upon humanity. It infests us. And even as we heal from it, we are exposed to it again and again and again. He said, this, this is where your focus should lie. And again, not that I'm going to uncontaminate or decontaminate you. It is not my job to make one of you clean. It is that I am seeking with the sincerity of my heart to be made clean in Jesus Christ. And that as a body of Christ, we are trying to create a sacred and holy space where people can come just as they are, not yet perfected, not yet perhaps made clean. They can come just as they are, and they are welcomed. This is the space we come to, to connect with our God in word and prayer and music. This is the place we come to, to sincerely offer up our struggles to one another and to God. This is the place we come, to be in community, to know we are not alone. To say, oh my gosh, how I've struggled with arrogance this week. Oh my goodness, how I've struggled with this. That's what church is meant to be about. That's what worship is is meant to be. A place where we can gather with our brothers and sisters and focus on God, refocus ourselves, find forgiveness, find whatever it is we need to go forth and be faithful, to share our worries with one another and God. Why in the world would we care how we're dressed for that? Or if a person has words memorized, that that somehow makes you more holy. Beloved, let us not be the Pharisees. Let us not be this brood of vipers that uses practices and ritual to tear one another down as a way of trying to push ourselves up upon the back of another. But instead, we would use these practices that we do as a way of trying to gather all of us together. This is what makes us one. This is what gives us common words to share and to speak together in community. And that we use those to build one another up, to lift everyone up together. That we might all seek to glorify God and to be drawn closer. Let us not worry about being contaminated by how much we put in an offering plate, but the songs we do or don't sing in worship, whether they are sacred or secular, by the perfection of a sermon, by the outfits that people are wearing, whether they sit to the front or to the back, is one of the reasons, as United Methodists, we remind everyone when we gather for communion, all are welcome at the table of God. All are just as worthy as another at the table of God. And all of us are beautiful and valued children of God. Perhaps it is time for us to begin to love and treat one another as if that was truth, as if that was real, and to let go of the things we use to judge, of the things we use to establish status, instead to say, none of that matters. You are a child of God, and you have come to this place to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to join us in a walk of discipleship. And we are so excited that you are here just as you are. Beloved, go forth just as you are, carrying our Savior in your heart, seeking to be sincere in all you do, even if the sincerity is to say, I don't know what to do or how to behave, or I don't know why something matters. Ask questions, dig deeper, and walk faithfully with your Lord in the Word this week. 
May God be with you, bless you, and keep you till we meet again.